So this is the larger East Bay. And I would just point out from the beginning that the land trust interests um, are of a couple or three different types. We're either purchasing property in fee or we're dealing with conservation easements, which is a, a, a conservation agreement between a, a, somebody either owns the land or a proponent for a project or whatever it might be, and the land trust. Both permanently protect the property. Um, and then in some cases, you'll see some coloration that shows a variance where we'll say that it's in fee, for instance, but it, we're in contract and it's not yet closed escrow. So I'll show some uh, variance there. And also with easements, we may be in contract to hold an easement, but the easement has not yet been recorded um, against the deed. Uh, uh, so, you know, going through that process. So as we go, as we go through, I'll try and highlight what some of those differences are. But again, it's just to say all of these properties are, are very real concerns that we're dealing with uh, on an ongoing basis and specifically um, as a kickoff to this year's work. So let's start again. There's the Holy Spay. Let's go down to the southern boundary um, in Fremont, uh, where the land trust is going to be holding a, a conservation easement on behalf of BART for the Warm Springs extension of BART. Um, this is a 13 and a half acre. Uh, wetland restoration that's uh, responds to the construction of a tunnel and for having to have built this tunnel, which is, I won't zoom in on this, but th there's a tunnel along this line. Lake Elizabeth was ha had to be drained and as an offset to that uh, environmental impact on behalf of BART and public transportation, there's a wetland restoration. Actually, maybe I will zoom in a little bit so you can see that. Um, this wetland will be held by us as an easement in perpetuity, and we will not only hold the easement, but we will maintain the property. It's a beautiful wetland restoration, and uh, we're really interested in being supportive of BART and public transportation as much as we think it's a balance point for conservation outcomes as well, but good transportation helps us with conservation on uh, perimeter lands. So having gone from Warm Springs, let's head up a little bit into Union City, where we're being asked to become involved with uh, Quarry Lakes Recreation Area at the entrance. The Quarry Lakes Recreation Area is an EBRPD project. I mean, they own and operate Quarry Lakes uh, uh, Recreation Area. At its entrance, there's a number of properties that are held by the state, Caltrans, and there's negotiations between Caltrans and Union City as to what to do with these properties. There's interest in it becoming housing. There's interest in it becoming uh, open space preservation. There's a lot of interest from a lot of perspectives. This is an important place to point out that the land trust is not an advocacy organization, but where there is some possible outcome that there would be conservation applied to these properties, um, we are typically brought into the conversation and make ourselves available to that possibility. Again, we're, not, we're neither for nor against any particular outcome here, but rather should it become uh, something that can be preserved and are holding an easement or even holding it in fee is helpful, we're available. And typically that also involves the necessity of being in the conversation early enough that we're, we're available to that possibility, but by the same token, not trying to tip it one way or the other. But you just call out, so we're as far down south as Fremont, Union City uh, coming up. And I'm gonna, keep, I'm gonna keep spending on this. There's a lot of properties here, but uh, we, will, we will make our way. And again, Q&A, you can ask me about any of them as we get further along. That Quarry Lakes Rec area is about 37 acres, by the way. So it's, it's, fairly, it's fairly significant as an entrance to that rec area. Um, coming up alongside Moraga, we are also being charged with holding an easement, um, essentially along the Indian Valley area of Moraga. If, um, if that's the golf course and, and, uh, and uh, uh, high school and so forth, you can see just over the hill, Indian Valley here. This is a Upper San Leandro open space area. When we talk about Upper San Leandro, it's relational to the Upper San Leandro Reservoir. So this is part of the uh, watershed that we also protected with the purchase of Car Ranch. 
this easement relates actually to the Wilder property, and this was in partnership with Ebb Mudd. So we would hold this in perpetuity as part of the preservation of this area. And then further up along that same corridor, um, and by the way, that's about 67 acres, then coming down to the Moraga Creek open space, another 45 acres. So that's 100 acres out in this valley that are meant to offset some of the environmental impact of Wilder up in this area, which as you know, is just off the freeway, high, Highway 24, significant development. But as that was carved out, there's real significant interest in preserving the habitat in this corridor as much as may be possible. And ongoing conversations, not only about mitigation, but fee title purchase, if at all possible. So that's along that, um, boundary of the La Mirinda corridor. Um, moving further out and further north, uh, really to the uh, western boundary of the East Bay, um, the Point Malade uh, development. This is something the Land Trust has been, again, with lots of arm's length, but still engaged since uh, we were involved with studies that go back about 15 years. Um, as to preferred alternatives uh, with respect to open space at a Point Malati development. It has not moved forward. It's about 400 acres of potential development. Um, it has been hotly contested. Again, we're not an, uh, 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 we're not a, uh, an organization that would be for or against. We're not an advocacy uh, organization. But with that said, Point Malati at some point will move forward and preserve significant open space along shoreline in Richmond. And we want to be available to being helpful as may be possible. Um, there's additional proposals that have come down the pike recently. There's also at least a couple uh, federal um, court cases pending against that. So, um, you know, it, it just takes a lot of time to work through these process, but we have a real significant interest in seeing it preserved appropriately according to the city mothers and fathers of Richmond as to how they might move forward. Um, and also we love a lot of what's gone on out there. I, I, Bruce and Sandra Byer might be with us today, but you know, the uh, track or the Trails for Richmond Action Committee that has done great work out there along shoreline in the Bay Trail for many, many years, a great example of how slowly but surely this will piece together and we wanna be as helpful as possible as, as time goes by. Another example, so again, that's about 400 acres that we strategically try and consider. Um, coming back along the southern boundary of Fernandez Ranch, which many of you I'm sure know in West County, are two easements that we partner with Ebb Mud to hold. Um, and what's recorded, um, Scow and Scow Canyon and Pavon Creeks are uh, 600 total acres that really are um, meant to mitigate the retrofit of the San Pablo Dam, which was when it was reconstructed a few years back, I think in 2009, um, it was almost 90 years old. Uh, it was subject to like a slumping at about a 7.5 earthquake. Um, magnitude so that would have caused potential flooding downstream in in Richmond, El Sobrante, San Pablo, those areas. So they they built up the dam, they retrofit it, and again the environmental impact of that retrofit was to set aside a significant amount of territory here uh, in essentially the uh, Pinole Valley watershed on the other side of Alhambra Valley Road. And we'll hold the easements there. And uh, at Bud will probably be more in charge of management of that because it, it does have a watershed component, but uh, we'll ensure that it is um, permanently protected. So with that said, you can also see that it is adjacent to Fernandez Ranch, just on the other side of Alhambra Valley. And this is very much of interest to us as well. This, this Pinole Valley Ridge, been in long time conversations about acquiring and working with Ebb Mudd to expand Fernandez Ranch, which is now at 1,185 acres. This acquisition, should we be able to uh, see it move forward? And we hope so, uh, sometime within a reasonable future would expand Fernandez to just over 1,600 acres. 
Uh, we are also uh, charged with holding easements along Christie Road here, just across Christie Road from Fernandez Ranch. That's an additional 550 acres. So you can see we rapidly get to more than 2,000 acres out here. Also very much of interest um, in the scale of scope, scale and scope of what we're dealing with is Franklin Canyon Golf Course here along Highway 4. Let me see if I can get a little bit closer on that. Um, this golf course has been there for a long time. The Fernandez family originally owned it as rangeland as part of their um, upland parcel here. Um, before uh, Prop 13, uh, they began to suffer from sort of the taxation being pricing them out of them being able to hold it. Uh, they put it into tomatoes post-World War II and uh, actually sent tomatoes over to, to the Del Monte factory to be canned and so forth. That was prosperous enough, but ultimately couldn't make it work. So they decided, well, let's sell it to a golf course and at least it'll remain as open space. And that's worked for many, many years. But um, the price of running this golf course as a business model has really exceeded its possibility. Um, there's about 300,000 gallons of water per year just put on the fairway to keep it going and they should probably be watering it with 600,000 gallons of potable water from that mud and of course that price keeps going up and um, green fees just cannot keep up with it we're talking about a golf course they probably have to charge $200 uh, you know green fee and that's that's not why people are playing Franklin Canyon it's because it's a municipal less expensive so that it can't really continue as a golf course so the proposal is that this would become a glamping site. Again, we take no position there, but this would be recreational vehicles and tent cabins and so forth, being able to camp for a week and 70 acres of this, uh, basically the back nine would be donated to the land trust, which would be extraordinarily positive uh, uh, entrance to Fernandez Ranch from the Northern boundary. And again, according to the city mothers and fathers of Hercules as to how they may want to go forward, should they go forward and approve this project, we'll have um, access for the public straight off of Highway 4 with 50 uh, parking places, with water, uh, bathrooms, uh, old cart paths that would provide great uh, access for uh, people with strollers, people with disabilities and so forth, and really quick access to the upland habitat for walkers, mountain bikers and the like. Right now, our access to Fernandez comes from the south, from the uh, Bay Area Ridge Trail, which is you know a bit of a hoof, but also from Coronado, we actually had to sue to say that this public road, being a public road, actually was a public road, and therefore the public could come up it. And there were those that said, well, it, it's a public road, but we don't want them to come up there. Anyway, we won that case. And so we have access to Fernandez from the west, and that allows people to, you know, actually access all the way to the Hercules shoreline. But we also have, of course, our staging area over here in Christie Road. So from the east, if we are able to attain northern access as well, the load gets carried all the way around this ultimately 2,000 acres, which would be a great outcome. Uh, we're very much excited about the possibility, again, without taking any kind of endorsing position, but you can hear my enthusiasm for the possibility. Um, and again, we probably have equestrians use this area more and uh, uh, those that were walking and biking come in here. This probably isn't as appropriate for horse trailers and the like. I want to point out here, there's a recent um, donation of property from the Dittmer family, 30 acres right there, and that we also permanently hold conservation easements here on the Contra Costa Goldfields, an endangered species. That's been a great success story. Went from almost no blooms to literally hundreds of thousands of blooms to bring back uh, the Goldfields, which is named, uh, endangered species named, last stand of an endangered species named for the uh, county in which it was discovered and uh, almost disappeared. But uh, we're bringing it back and it's, again, some vernal pools here that have also been working their magic. And all of that's right up against Crockett Hill. So we're trying to figure out a way to also have people be able to get from here to there. EBRPD's Crockett Hills uh, Preserve over there. So let's take a closer look at that possibility. So if I get over to the Christie Road Preserve that we showed before, I'm now going to shift east to a property that's Bar the Barnett family. 
This property is in contract and over the next couple or three years, we will close on it and you can see how connective it is to other ranch land that the land trust owns, Guston property, due to Ranch, Sky Ranch and so forth. In fact, let me, let me back out a little bit so you can see the Franklin Ridge and the relationship of Barnett to that. Mount Wanda, Almond, which we recently uh, purchased, you can see how connective that is, east, west, north, south. Uh, we can talk about getting down to Briones through Stonehurst and so forth. This is all of what we're trying to connect. Getting to Barnett is interesting because once you're there, it almost touches all the way out. The proposal, and we think it's, it's a distinct possibility, is from Barnett, there's a railroad tunnel. So keep your eye right here. I'm gonna go to a railroad tunnel on one side. This is the BNSF railroad. This is a very active railroad line, uh, thanks to John Muir, who actually uh, proposed and endorsed the notion of the railroad coming in to uh, ship fruit from his farm. Um, and this, the result is this line. Here's the other side of the tunnel there. So if I go out, you can see that tunnel connects and on top of it is just the easement of the BNSF Railroad. Now, the railroad is not the easiest partner to negotiate with, but as a corridor, there is some notion that that's a public property in some, to some benefit. And in as much as it's not a, an at-grade crossing, we're walking on top of the tunnel, being able to do that and then come down here and either get into the north meadow of Fernandez Ranch or down here along Christie Road and out to the Christie Road staging area. But more importantly, even a trail, well, not more importantly, but significantly as well, is a trail which has been um, uh, negotiated with CDFW and so forth across this mitigation property to get up to Berry Hill Road and then across coming Skyway to Crockett Hills. So that connects not only all of the Franklin Ridge out to Hercules, but it connects all of Franklin Ridge to the Bay Area Trail coming from the south and across Highway 4. And it's not easy to get the Bay Area Ridge Trail across Highway 4, but for getting to coming Skyway. So that's sort of the holy grail of connectivity. And we expect that we're all the way there via the purchase of Barnett. And you will hear more about that as, as days go by and we get closer to campaigning on that. We're going through some diligence right now and so forth. But I'll, I'll dwell on that no longer and move us out to other uh, more immediate concerns, which are, um, let me get a view here of just a little bit more of the region. You see Briones and so forth. If I tilt down, I'm sure you're significantly aware of our campaign to help restore Chaco Marsh and provide public access there. So 231 acre saltwater marsh restoration and including this property, 18 acres, which recently purchased and donated to the land trust by Marathon, $4 million for 18 acres, extraordinarily generous donation. It gets us all the way out to the North Reach. Uh, this restoration is being done in very close partnership with uh, Contra Costa County Flood Control. If you hear stamping and winnowing uh, in the background, that's uh, tall pony Paul Detchens, who's senior engineer for uh, flood control, who is really the lead on that restoration. The land trust comes in and does uh, public access. And this will be an extraordinarily uh, wonderful uh, saltwater marsh restoration that actually addresses sea level rise and so forth to supplant Peyton Marsh and Point Edith, which will slowly be inundated by sea level rise. This becomes the refuge property for all of that wildlife and the functional saltwater marsh at the mouth of the Walnut Creek Channel to provide also elements of flood control. And Paul is very involved with Lower Walnut Creek up here as well. This is the, the crown in the jewel, we feel, of that public access. We're thrilled to be working with him. The public access piece of this, it's a $24.5 million project, not counting the $4 million um, donation of land. Uh, Five million of that is for public access, of which we are raising $1 million from uh, private donations. 
we're six hundred thousand dollars of the way there so we're essentially fundraising to the gap of four hundred thousand dollars by the this summer by the end of this summer and uh, we're well on our way so we're very enthusiastic and excited about how well this is going and um, if you're thinking of a place to make a donation you know right now uh, that's a great place to put your money it's such a great investment it'll be there for all time and providing public benefit of access environmental education but also a world-class birding site and refuge for all of that wildlife that uh, live at shoreline there um, and we're we're conducting tours as well. So, you know, if there are those that are interested, please let us know. We'll, we'll take you out on property. It's a wonderful place to visit as well. Now, going further out along proper, around shoreline, again, I'm trying to show you the scale and scope of all that we're working on is Family Harvest Farm. This is a 40 acre property out along Power Avenue. Um, it's PG&E property that we've worked, we've, we've partnered up with PG&E to license those 40 acres from which we've carved out a 3.5 acre uh, organic farm. It's a new program of John Muir Land Trust Family Harvest Farm to provide employment for emancipating foster youth and to encourage employment skills, job training to prepare them for life outside of the foster uh, program. Um, it's, it's a wonderfully inspiring program. We've had lots of community uh, involvement. I think Paul Bettelheim's on the phone, Sunrise Rotary and the like, and uh, uh, Moraga Kiwanis. So we've had people come and, and volunteer all sorts of construction and infrastructure installation out here. It's been wonderful to see that build out. Importantly, we have lots of core collaborators like First Place for Youth and Uplift Family Services and Youth Homes at Contra Costa County and so forth, working together to manage the flow of apprentices that, again, are kids that are aging out of the foster youth program so that they have a job which keeps them in the program. They have encouragement and, and mentoring to help them move forward with either employment or education, advanced education and so forth, whatever their life path is to have all of the uh, sort of the safety nets that so many of us enjoy that no fault of their own, they don't necessarily have readily available and to make sure that they're getting that, that little bit of extra help and a wonderful, there's nothing more restorative than working with plants and, and as a team out on a, an organic farm to provide foodstuffs to a, what's otherwise a food desert, CSA programs and so forth. Um, lots and lots of promise going forward. And we're very, very grateful to so many uh, collaborators helping us with that uh, going forward. So um, come visit Family Harvest Farm as COVID begins to lift. And I, we're still also virtual, but I, I, we're feeling hopeful that maybe we're getting past the worst of COVID and everybody get your vaccination as best you can. And, and you know, things are beginning to turn the corner and we'll, we'll see you out on some of these properties, hopefully not too distant future. In the meantime, again, thank you for joining us virtually today. Now I'm gonna move south, fly away to McGee Preserve. This is down in the Alamo Diablo area. Uh, McGee Preserve is a Davidon Homes uh, development. Um, it's about 410 acres total. Uh, 381 of those acres are gonna be preserved. Again, conservation easement, we're working close partnership with EBRPD, uh, East Bay Regional Park District. The land trust will hold the easements to permanently protect these properties. You can see if I zoom out from them, how they are, sort of line, a line on this court, it's about seven, seven miles away uh, from uh, Car Ranch to the like, but it's a, it's a major project. Uh, we're very excited to be involved in it. It's gonna be a spectacular open space. And as, as you can see, it's aligned adjacent to the Sycamore Valley Regional Open Space Preserve. So again, the collaborative partnering with EBRPD to protect these areas that are contiguous with other open space uh, parkland is, is really an exciting outcome for, uh, for people to be able to enjoy. A couple of real quick snapshots of, of um, neighborhood park destinations that we've preserved. Uh, probably could look at these as all three at once, but we'll give it a shot this way, would be a uh, Botfish Preserve, that's seven acres uh, that we preserved long ago. Um, another is Ocalanus Ridge 
over here, 23 acres adjacent to the whole um, Ocalanus Ridge open space area, long sought after by uh, folks in Walnut Creek. You'll be seeing from 12 cities when you're up on that point. It's a great place to go take a, a short walk for a great view. Um, recently, uh, the uh, Hamlin Nature Park, which we call Batwing, uh, but worked last year with City of Lafayette to provide those 20, yeah, 20 acres for Batwing or Hamlin. That's going to be a very nearby neighborhood park. And then importantly, and I'll, a little bit less breathlessly, come in to talk about a really important project. We're getting very close now to the next big thing, right? So Pacheco Marsh wrapping up. We're gonna be very focused on a couple of these projects here. One, the land trust is charged with holding conservation easements. We purchased, I should say, stop for a second. So we purchased this 84 acre uh, painted rock property. The remainder is 421 acres, 505 acres total. We call it painted rock park. Um, we will hold the conservation easements uh, on this development, which essentially these green areas is where housing will be inserted. And as you know, over here, Rancho Laguna two, there's housing here and housing here. The rest of it is open space and to be permanently protected again as a, an element of the land trust portfolio. I'm gonna zoom really close in on something. And this is, this is moving as we speak, we're working hard on squaring away all that is necessary to provide uh, permanent uh, stewardship of these properties with the proponent and what, what's gonna be necessary in terms of price tag and support to do that. And it's actually been a very good working relationship. The reason I'm zooming in here is that there's a, an important notch here to take a, uh, take a peek at. Can you see that line, that corner there? This parcel is privately owned. If you were to take this parcel line and come out, I don't have it diagrammed here, but this one comes out to a point right about there. It finishes there. This is a notch that is actually part of this ownership, which is Ebb Mud. It's the Lafayette Moraga Trail that is managed by EBRPD. And here's the proponent's um, mitigation area that we will, we will hold the, the uh, conservation easement on. And then this notch touches it. So we're able to have trail come from this 505 acre park down to the Moraga Lafayette Trail here. There's no imped impediment to get there down along that trail here. And as I back out, you'll begin to see how that connects to not only St. Mary's College, also Bollinger Canyon, if you wanna come in that way, but most importantly, the connection of that 505 acres to what really is the next big thing for us, the Harvey Ranch project, which is here, which is essentially the Southern boundary of St. Mary's College connecting out to Carr Ranch across the Roberts property, which this trail easement has been perfected, and then out to 15,500 acres of the Upper San Leandro watershed, which is all at mud property and with beautiful trail systems and so forth. And also this sort of connectivity seven miles out or less than two miles to Rossmore and potential trail connections out to that valley. But lots and lots of benefit to Harvey Ranch ultimately being sort of the missing piece. It's the next missing piece to connect up all of those properties. And where it connects is either through the campus, um, through collaborative agreement and or just for student body as well, come up to a swing gate there, which is just off of the observatory and the cross is down here, the observatory there and the swing gate through here. And uh, Bob's your uncle, you come straight up that ridge and all the way out. We also are looking at building a staging area here down in Bollinger Canyons. This is a hundred acres here, another 50 acres across Bollinger Canyon, beautiful little, uh, stable here where we could build a staging area and cr come cross creek right about there to Harvey Ranch or there's a public trail right now that comes up along here it's actually utilized quite a bit by the public as we speak or maybe not as we speak but it's used on a daily basis to come up yet another 
direction through what uh, is referred to as the Grove at St. Mary's College. We expect lots of really warm and positive partnering is beginning to evolve with St. Mary's College. Uh, we expect the benefit to, you know, direct benefit to the, uh, the constituents surrounding uh, specifically Moraga, but also as a destination, we often point out there's Lafayette Reservoir, 1.2 million visitors a year. You can see how enormously positive a destination this is as, at a landscape level, but also just walking, no vehicle, or, or use a bike, use a mountain bike, connectivity all the way out. So we're feeling very, very uh, positive about this. This is a $3.5 million project minimum. Stretch goal would be $4 million to be able to ensure we're able to provide the uh, staging area and so forth but we're going to be off to the races you'll hear more about this um essentially fall uh announcement we'll we'll be raising funds fall to fall um uh, in the next year so 2021 fall to fall of end of year 2022 i think i've got that right um i lose track too much too much property too many acres uh too much money to raise but that's what we do and always with your help. So um, I think that's enough. Believe it or not, there are others that I would put on the map, but they really are not. I've gone further than I normally do. Some of this we rather typically hold in a little bit more confidence, but we figured, you know, you should know that we're busy. It's a, it's a very lean uh, business model. We, we move millions of dollars and deal with thousands of acres with a full-time equivalent of eight people. Uh, I think the work speaks for itself. We get a lot done. And uh, there's, believe it or not, there's hundreds and hundreds of more acres I could put on the map. But just in, in uh, deference and respect for the uh, families and so forth, we hold those in even greater confidence. So you've seen, you've seen more than you normally would see. And there's even more to see uh, some other day in the not hopefully too distant future. And I think with that, again, I'm sorry to rush through that so quickly. I hope it was informative. Happy to do Q&A, but just to slow it down a minute to be able to enjoy uh, maybe a different view than the, the technical mapping. Let's, let's just go through some beauty shots of, of some of what's out there and see the quality of some of these properties. So these are, you know, these are the, the property icons that we typically produce when we've closed on a property and we've got more than that's more than just listed here, but you see the quality of it, our beautiful, wonderful designer, Megan Mailer's uh, great work on uh, these kinds of captures to try and tell the story of Car Ranch. Shoreline at Point Mulatte. That's the McGee Preserve. That's a trail in Stonehurst, the original project that started the uh, Martinez Regional Land Trust, now John Muir Land Trust. Sky Ranch along the Franklin Ridge. Almond Ranch, and thank you for all of your support recently for that missing piece property. Gorgeous. That's a recent donation from the Dittner, Dittmer family. Really interesting property just across the road from Fernandez. The Gustin property back up on Franklin Ridge. So that's part of the 421 acre painted rock remainder, total 505 that we were just talking about. Fantastic property. Franklin Ridge Dutra Ranch. The Botfish Preserve. 
these are just the first sprouts of corn out of Family Harvest Farm. This is a photo that I had available. And I thought it showed sort of the new beginning, but the changes out there are are inspiring. This is a barely a uh, just the beginning of what it is now. Um, so much more has happened since then. It's a, just a thriving outcome. Oklahoma's Ridge, Lafayette, Pacheco Marsh. Which this is a good place to put in your kayak. And then coming up, I'll let I'll let Steph, uh, Melanie hopefully here uh, talk a little bit about um, Twilight. Uh, we've got a great community program coming up here and um, as an invitation to you all. Yeah, so uh, we've been uh, doing this Twilight event for many years now and typically it, it, it um, takes place at Fernandez Ranch. Um, but last year and this year we'll be doing it virtually. Um, and it, we've parsed it out over three weeks on Thursdays from four to five. Um, so uh, it'll start on May 20th, go on the 27th, and then June 3rd. The first one is Meet a Screech Owl, uh, partnering with Lindsay Wildlife Experience. The second one will be the Dawning of Family Harvest Farm. So we'll uh, take you out, um, um, show some pictures of the farm and what's going on out there. And then the third one is the Stargazing. Uh, with the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and specifically this year, they'll be exploring the red planet Mars and what it looks like at this time of the year. So, so I with think, that, we're yeah, going to do some Q&A. Let's do some q and I've got some questions um, that have come in. The first one is from Bruce and Sandra Bayart. Um, mm -hmm. He's, they say warm springs is BART paying for wetlands maintenance and perpetuity. Yes, uh, thanks, Bruce. And again, thanks to Bruce and Sandra for all their great work with the Bay Trail. Amazing work. I've known Bruce since day one at the Land Trust. He's been at it. Um, I, I, gee, I, they're founders, I believe, with the Bay Area Ridge Trail. I've, I've got it someplace, I'm sure that. Um, what was it 1999, Bruce, that uh, the uh, the uh, Bay Area Ridge Trail, I mean, uh, the Bay Trail was founded and in, uh, incredibly long term patience to get a lot done. So our hats off to uh, Bruce and Sandra and all that was accomplished there. And then, yes, yeah, specifically uh, with Warm Springs, um, BART is uh, there's a significant endowment, permanent, permanently restricted endowment to generate uh, the revenue to pay for the maintenance and uh, long-term uh, protection of that of that wetland area. BART has actually been great to work with. Uh, they've got a great team. They've done beautiful work down there, and it was uh, it's always interesting to be around such a major infrastructure project to to drain a lake and kind of get it right and build a tunnel and to provide public uh, public access to transportation and then put it all back together and and actually have a successful restoration project that's no small feat so uh we're we're very interested in trying to be helpful with that down south great and we have another question from bob simmons um uh -huh. mayor we, simmons yes uh when you acquire an easement for property that adjoins publicly owned open space does your easement allow you to provide for public access via trails uh, it's a great question. It's certainly something that we always, and Bob's a real advocate for trails, long time advocate for open space and, and lots of great outcomes in, in his jurisdictions, including Oklahoma's Ridge. Bob was, you know, very central to our acquisition of Oklahoma's Ridge, along with uh, Leslie and Bill and others that are probably on the line, um, long sought after. We're sort of at the long end of that. So yes, if it's adjacent, um, if, if it's an easement and we're working with CDFW and other regulatory agencies, we certainly wanna have that conversation early and have it outlined as part of the easement and an allowance for it. One of the reasons to do that, it's not just because we favor trails, it's too because we feel as though trails can work in balance with, with permanent protection of habitat. But three, if you don't put that trail in and people just start walking out there, you're in an immediate violation. And then our job has to be 
trying to keep the public to not go out on a trail that we know they're going to go out on. So it's actually much more important to work with regulatory agencies to accommodate trail access so that we don't have violations on the, uh, on the property. The other thing is to work with the public to get them to really specifically understand, and this is going to be an ongoing issue in the Bay Area, to stay on trail. You know, when we go out into nature, I'm sorry, I'm going to pontificate a little bit here. When you go out into nature and you say, oh, I'm, everything's now available to me. And there's a beautiful rock over there. I think I'll go walk over there. And then a million other people go walk over there and it's all off trail. Now you're actually really impacting habitat in a negative way. So if we get trails on an easement, we want to make sure that the trails are adequate to public use and that also the public is collaborative with us to use those trails and not just go everywhere. So, but great question. And yeah, Bob's well acquainted with trying to hit that balance. All right. Okay. I have an anonymous question. Um, when is uh -oh. Pacheco Marsh complete and open to the public? Oh, I thought the anonymity was going to make it a hard question. That's actually, well, it is a hard question. Um, so our, our thought is the mobilization, I'm going to try and get up there. Um, the thought is mobilization, and, and I think Paul is, is well on his way. It's out to bid, and I think they've accepted bid um, to do restoration that would start mobilized this summer. A year later, um, that should essentially be completed. So that's summer of 2021 to summer of 2022. Uh, we would then surface the public, public access um, on that. The restoration essentially provides the great foundation for the, uh, the public access, Paul typically describes it, the icing on top of the cake. Yeah. Um, and we appreciate being described in such a sweet manner. Thank you, Paul. Um, and that would take essentially another year. And we're going through the permitting process to allow that to happen, hopefully as seamlessly as possible with the restoration project. So I think that takes us out to essentially summer of see 2021 22, 22 summer of 2023 it sounds like or more or less maybe 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 we have to go all the way into the winter of 2023 in which case we would open it spring 2024 at the latest and if it's not open by then i know you'll come find me and 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 read me out for something and i'm we're trying to go as fast as we can that's a lot it's a big big uh project could be a yeah. lot of a lot of action out there and I don't see this question here, but I, I will just pose it because I, I know um, it's a it's one that comes up a lot is, you know, what happens if we can't raise all the funds um, that are necessary? We're, we're doing a really good job, um, but um, maybe you want to speak to that, Linus, what, what well, happens? Become a you know, if you don't raise all the, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It's one that we tend to say, well, we're going to raise all the funds. So don't ask us that question. We're just going to do it. Um, we don't, we don't want to create the allowance that somehow we can underfund a project. That's where you really start getting into trouble. Not so much as an organization as you're, you're under, you're under subscribing the, the public benefit that we, we really want to be able to provide for future generations. And it's very difficult to go back and, and do a second and third round. You want to get as much accomplished right up front as possible. You know, even if you're going to be doing it in phases, you still want to have the funding available to get to phase two, to get to phase three. With that said, um, if you don't fund, it, it diminishes the outcome. So, uh, you know, we have not an opulent public access project, but there is a range of outcome. And should we not fund all that we want to achieve, um, you know, you get a few less amenities. Uh, and it, like I say, it's very hard to go back and then, you know, try and fundraise more to provide additional amenities later. So help us get it all the way across the finish line here over the next uh, few months. And, and we'll see really great outcomes there at the uh, North Shore. Great. Okay. So then um, Shirley Wiegan asks, is there a hiking trail at Painted Rock? Where is the trailhead? How long is it? There is a hiking trail at Painted Rock and there will be many more hiking trails at Painted Rock. The trailhead right now is at the top of uh, Fay Hill Road, which comes off of Ream Valley Road. Um, as you're going uphill on Ream, you take a left into what looks like the development for, I always call it Rancho Lagoda 2. I can't remember the name of what it is. Those names tend to kind of drift around but anyway go into the development you go to the top of the hill there's a small parking area you're at the ridge 
park your car, walk out onto the ridge, you can enjoy the view, you'll see all of the 421 acres or whatever it is, 22 acres along that ridge. And then uh, you'll get to the gate for, for um, Painted Rock and be able to walk essentially fire road trail as it exists right now. There is one other way to access the trail. It's not formally open, but um, to cross the road, cross Reem and do it carefully uh, at Chalda. There's an old fire road that's been um, sort of grubbed out a little bit that will, is also a trail to get to the top. And that's more of a natural access to the property, it goes straight to Painted Rock. But again, we will develop out all of that trail system relative to the entire Painted Rock property, the whole 505 in connective ways that are already a part of the, uh, the permitting uh, you know, they are, they're, they're part of the entitlement of the development that many of those trails have been outlined and will connect into those. So you'll be able to come in from the other, from the backside in any number of ways. But if you want to get up there today, just go to the top of Fay Hill Road, walk along the ridge, you're going to see everything. Or if you want to rough it up uh, off of Chalda, that's a, that's a fire road to the top. Okay, um, we have another anonymous question. Um, they came in a little late. They missed the Quarry Lakes Recreation Area entrance portion. Mm -hmm. um, they're aware of the city of Fremont and Union City have that they have plans to begin a large scale construction around the area. Um, they ask, would you be doing something to preserve the lands around the region? This is very early. Um, the proposal, and again, we we don't take a position. I mean, if the the city mothers and fathers of Union City and Fremont, and you know, it is right there on the border and both have to be involved in that approving process. If they build all of this out by purchasing the land from Caltrans uh, and Caltrans is proposing to sell the land to provide for infrastructure um, maintenance and so forth, which some would say, well, Caltrans you know, has bonds and all sorts of other ways. It, some some folks let me give you a bigger picture and again i'm not taking a position here but you know the notion of selling um assets like buildings or land and so forth to provide for infrastructure is usually you can only sell it once you, you need a more sustainable revenue source than that and because of the density and the uh highest best use potential here i think caltrans looks at it and goes well you know we could probably get a lot of money for that land that said should Union City and Fremont say, well, there are, that's what we want to do, we want to build it out, or perhaps there are obstacles to being able to do that sufficiently, or, or we can't do it at all. The land trust is simply available to hold conservation easements and permanently protect what is right now a farm. This is all farmland um, at the entrance to Quarry Lakes Rec area, which we think is, you know, more in keeping perhaps with its natural uh, quality but again um, it's it's up to what this area wants to do as to providing housing and or highway ex, uh, access to Niles Canyon and so forth there's a lot a lot of moving parts there um, I try and stay as uh, in some ways naive of all of that as possible in as much as it's really not our business our business is much more downstream as a neutral of whatever transpires once folks have worked it out you know if there's a conservation issue that has to be undertaken, we are available to try to be of service in that way. And certainly in this case, in some sort of uh, partnership or, you know, reflective of the park district's wishes as well. Uh, I see this as something where the park district has an expressed uh, potential interest over and above Union City and Fremont, but we'll see where it lands. I'm just making folks aware that we're available to be of help, sort of like with Point Milate. It's not gonna be tomorrow that any of that squares away, but as it begins to move, we want folks to know that we're available to that conversation to try and provide good outcomes. Great. Um, uh, the Bayards also asked, should we contribute now or await a matching grant program for Pacheco Marsh? Um, <laughs> I would say if you're interested in the Pacheco Marsh um, project, please contribute now. Um, we yeah, we're kind have, of on it. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, Melanie, go ahead. We don't have a, a matching grant, grant opportunity right now, 
Um, and Les Linus said, we're through the end of June, um, we're hoping to raise that 400,000. So if you're thinking about making a gift to the campaign, um, please do so now, it'd be very helpful. Yeah, we're, we're enough on a ticking clock there. That, and there have been some match, match grants earlier on with uh, Pacheco, but I think we're, we're just trying to hit that number and move forward. And, and we have other fundraising that's going on uh, with respect to uh, agency funding and so forth. But that million dollars, to be able to show that million dollars from individual contributions from the public, that's actually a really helpful message to the agencies to say, you know, this, you know we have real community support for expenditure bond funds as well. Yeah. Okay, a lot of really great questions coming in here. So thanks everybody. I have one from Karen Phillips who says, thank you JMLT for all you do. I have two questions. One, can you give me a general percentage or summary of how many vernal pools are at JMLT's uh, and JMLT's uh, property? And two, is there a plan for creating a habitat for the monarch butterfly on JMLT land, uh, especially where they migrate? Um, I'll start with the second question. First, the, um, the mon there's a monarch program actually going on a number of places. Um, we, there's monarch plantings of milkweed and the like up along Franklin Ridge and including on Mount Wanda and beyond, but specifically in La Mirinda and uh, the Painted Rock area and so forth. Um, Local residents there uh, have undertaken a pretty significant push to uh, to plant for monarchs, and we're we're happy to you know collaborate with those that want to uh, produce that kind of habitat to do so. Yeah, and I you know it's most propitious to do it where where they're in a migratory corridor. But um, oh, I wish I could name names. I'm sorry, I'm going up on on names. But yeah, there's there's been some real interest, and yes, we are. Um, we're working on that specifically in La Mirinda right now as well. Okay, and I'm sorry, did you mention about the vernal pools? Oh, the vernal pools, right. Yeah. Um, so the vernal pools that I mentioned before actually were a mitigation effort um, on behalf of the widening of uh, Highway 4. I think there's four man-made vernal pools here, as I recall. You can just see them, one, two, three, four. I believe that's right. But with that said, there's also this effect with the cow hooves, not to digress, for the Contra Costa gold fields, which also create that pooling for grazing that creates just the right wetland for Contra Costa gold fields to, to uh, thrive and bloom. So this whole Rodeo Creek corridor here um, is a really rich example of uh, the success of vernal pools and specifically, again, uh, really precise grazing uh, management to provide for uh, the benefit to other habitat that encourages Contra Costa gold fields. As to how many vernal pools we have throughout all of our properties, I'd have to turn to Glenn and do some research on that. It's an interesting question. I can't off the top of my head uh, name it. So I hope that's the beginning of an answer. And I would love to get back to you with a, with a more complete one about how much of our habitat actually includes uh, vernal pools, not just man-made, but you know, other, other natural habitat. Yeah, okay. We have a question from Keel Mant. Um, when you mentioned the easement between Alhambra Valley Boulevard and San Pablo Dam, is there any possibility of a trail connecting those points? It would connect Fernandez to the ridge. I think you're talking about here, is that right? Uh, yes, must be. Yes, that, that trail would already exist. So the Bay Area Ridge Trail, I think I'm, I'm asking, I think I'm answering your question. So the Bay Area Ridge Trail already goes up through the backside of Fernandez. This also, I would say, just so you know, would become conservation easements. There's enough, I mean, this is extraordinary habitat. It's just lush and beautiful and offsets a lot of, of development that's inevitably happening in our area. To preserve this, protect it permanently is critical. We never wanna see it become uh, uh, so, some sort of um, uh, surplus land that would, would be 
by right available for housing. It's the wrong place to be destroying habitat. But with that said, um, it's not going to happen. This is this is going to be permanently protected, and this will be an easement similar to this. The upland, the ridge, not so much. That is actually much more suitable to um, acquisition and trails development. But that trail across would be, I'm sure, along this alignment because it already exists as a Bay Area Ridge Trail. Now, can that connect out into? Um, uh, carriage Hills and the like, yes, we believe it can. We think it can take it all the way to Kennedy Grove. There's some negotiations around that and so forth, but we'll, we're, we're working our way through that. So yeah, there's a lot of trail connectivity through that as well. Nothing excludes the trail. The trail is already established with the Bay Area Ridge Trail, if I'm answering your question correctly. I think that's what you're interested in. Okay, we're um, sort of getting to close to one o'clock. Uh, I thought we would do um, maybe two more. Um, we have a question from Rebecca and Kirk Bosek. What, what is Peyton Marsh? Peyton Marsh, which we saw out and, and the Boseks, I think they came out and saw, yeah, they were on one of the tours. So, but I think it's maybe when we're out there, you're really at a certain altitude where it's, it's hard to appreciate this marsh, which is more at sea level, as it were. As we discussed when we were out there, the spoils from dredging along Walnut Creek, which used to look very different than this, it was a meander, it was navigable by ocean going ships, it went all the way up, people would go all the way up on ships to uh, Tassajara and, and uh, Diablo Valley and so forth to collect wheat, bring it back to, to uh, Pacheco, which was along the first four miles of the creek where there was a flower, uh, mill and so forth. I mean, this was, this was the heart of, of commercial activity in Contra Costa back in the, the late 19th century until this silted in. And it's been a, an engineering issue ever since, right? Is how do you keep this free and clear? Now in a straight line, it got channelized upstream in the 60s to create flood control in downtown Walnut Creek and the like. Anyway, all of that dredging those dredge spoils been piled onto Pacheco Marsh. So we have elevation capital here, which is great for saltwater marsh re restoration because we can sculpt this and not have to bring in any kind of other uh, earth or spoils to build that up. What's happening here with Peyton Marsh, which you see there, is the original saltwater marsh um, scale and of and, uh, you know, elevation back when there hadn't been spoils put on top of a now dewatered marsh that would otherwise be available to tidal flow. It would be affected by tidal flow. We're going to cut channels, east, west, north, south, into Pacheco Marsh, and then the detrification of all of the additional stream channels to make that functional saltwater marsh. Peyton Marsh already has that. If I zoom in on this, you can see those canals, those channels feeding this saltwater marsh. But as sea level rise increases, you know, as much as five feet, all of this becomes inundated. So this Peyton Marsh is no longer a functional saltwater marsh, it's underwater. Whereas Pacheco Marsh is now the viable refuge for all of the wildlife that was here to move upland into a functional saltwater marsh at Pacheco. Similarly, some of the same impact will happen to Point Edith over here on the other side. So it's also critical that we get this done now because as sea level rises, should it inundate this, which it would, before we sculpt it into a restored saltwater marsh, you lose the opportunity. It has to be engineered before sea level rise takes it over or, or you've, lost the, you've lost your chance. Yeah. And Bobby is, I was thinking of you, Bobby, when I was talking about monarch butterfly uh, habitat over in, in Moraga. So I was just, um, suddenly the name came. Sorry about that. I was, it's too much going on. Um, um, so yes, uh, when we were out there to the, the Bosek family, when we got to the very North reach, you could look over to the West towards the, Brio to the uh, uh, Benicia bridge. You could see that marshland down at shoreline. That's Peyton Marsh which again, we're, we're gonna to lose to sea level rise. 
it will inundate. Okay, so we're just a little after one. There's there's one more question that I wanted to to pose, um, and it's anonymous, and it's about the Harvey campaign. Um, someone on the call is interested. What is that? Um, what's the amount of that campaign? And um, you had mentioned the timeline, but maybe you just want to go over that one more time. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's a three point five million dollar uh, project budget with a $4 million stretch budget that it considers additional staging area amenities and so forth. But to get it across the finish line, acquired and permanently protected, $3.5 million. We're essentially telling you about it now. We will more or less launch it into what is kind of a quiet period, even though we're not being very quiet about it this spring. But you will hear about it as a public uh, campaign in the fall of 2021, so this coming fall, and then we will close um, in um, the following year. Is that right, Melanie? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll basically be in a year campaign starting this fall to raise the $3.5 million for Harvey Ranch. We already have some, some very generous support and people who are um, thoughtfully considering generous support all of those things are very, uh, very important to this project. Um, it's, it's, it's not as subject to agency support as some projects because of where it lay. And yet I can't think of a more critically important missing piece and connectivity to this, to this larger uh, corridor, the whole of, I mean, just look at, the landmass that we're dealing with and how it points one to the other. And then again, this all connects. So the trails are there to get all the way out. It's one of the largest landmass connections in, in the region. Um, so, yeah. you know, there's Brionis, that's what, about 6,000 acres there. You can see it's, it's, it's got proportionally some of the same sort of importance. Yeah, so. very exciting. Okay, well, I think that concludes our program. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And if there are any questions, feel free to follow up in the email confirmation that you received is my email. So feel free to email, email me there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.